Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good day. I always have to make sure I see that live button so that you can hear me. Thank you so much for joining us for Prep Camp. We appreciate the investment you're making in yourself and hopefully you're getting some great information throughout the week. Today, we are going to be going behind the scenes talking with test prep organizations. My name is Fanae Croft. I'm going to host the event. I'm the field marketing manager for the Americas region here at the Graduate Management Admission Council. And I go on the road, various cities, delivering GMAT presentations. I get questions all the time about um, what's the best way to approach the exam if I'm trying to get a 700. How do I think about the analytical writing assessment section? Should I get a test? Um, should I work with a test prep company? Which ones are the best? Well, today we're going to take you behind the scenes, give you some extra insight from the experts themselves. Before we get to that, though, I want to make sure we handle a few housekeeping things. You're watching us via YouTube, and while you're going to hear from us, we'll chat for the next 35 to 40 minutes, and then at the end, we'll take any questions that you have. So as we talk, if you have a question now that you're just really interested in, go ahead and type it in there, or if something comes up throughout the conversation, just post your question to the comment section, and we will make sure we address as many questions as possible uh, within the hour that we have together. Also, want to tell you about a survey. We do candidate surveys. We're trying to gain insights, have a better understanding of your needs, what you're going through out there. So if you go to mba.com backslash surveys, you can fill out our survey. It's only about two or three questions. It should take you about 10 seconds, and you have the opportunity to win your choice of either a $50 exam voucher or a $50 Amazon gift card, depending on what suits your fancy. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest today. We have Dennis Yim. He's representing, representing um, Kaplan. No, no, no. We don't have Dennis. Be, it's Jed Helm representing. We have Jed Helm. I'm sorry about that. We have Jed um, Helm representing Kaplan. We also have David Chong with Manhattan Prep. We have Brian Galvin representing Veritas Prep. And then we have John Fulmer representing the Princeton Review. So we have all the major players here to have a conversation with us today. And so thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Great to be here. Good. We got a lot to get to. We got a lot of questions to uh, ask, and I want to get all of your perspectives. So, Jed, will you start us off and tell us what's your philosophy on how candidates should approach approach exam prep? Well, the, the most important ideas are, you know, we've learned at Kaplan that there's no two test takers that are exactly the same. And so test takers really need to, to start out by analyzing their own strengths and weaknesses. And then they've got to get the resources they need to achieve their target score. Um, and the type of practice you want to do is as much like test day as possible. That's why we offer the official test day experience. Um, and so many resources to our students because um, I don't know exactly without seeing your test results which resources are going to be right for you. Um, so you've got to find the right resources to hit your individual strengths and weaknesses and practice them in the most effective way for you. Anybody else want to jump in there? David? Uh, yeah, I'll echo some of those, some of those sentiments. Um, I mean, the mantra should be know thyself, right? whether that's through practice tests or focus practice on, on topics that you know are issues for you, uh, the better you can suss out what you need to focus on during your prep, and the better you can figure out which topics are not your friend on the day of the test, the better you're going to set yourself up for success. So you know, getting your hands on realistic resources and holding yourself to, for example, taking a, a practice test under realistic conditions, putting your phone away, Telling your friends and your mom to leave you alone, right? Like focus for four hours, sit down and knock it out. Those kinds of things are really going to accelerate your prep and help you on test day. Brian? Yeah, I think um, I may deep dive a second and look at, you know, what makes effective prep. And I think one thing people do incorrectly is you think of anybody taking the GMAT has been successful academically before. And so uh, I think recognizing that this test is a little different in that most tests you've taken are exit exams. It's a midterm or a final. Did you learn the knowledge we want you to have? This is much more of an application test. And uh, what can you do with kind of a core set of knowledge? And so I think sort of embracing the fact that one, it's not a pure knowledge test. 
And two, it's okay to struggle a little bit early on. I think a lot of people want to race to using the stopwatch. And hey, it's a time test. I got to get questions right in two minutes. I think the first thing I would say, anybody starting to prep, is give yourself a learn phase where the stopwatch is gone and you force yourself to struggle through it. Um, I, I think anybody in this panel and anybody at GMAC headquarters um, in Reston would probably admit we've written solutions that aren't the most helpful thing in the world. They're technically right, but man, it's hard to make them great. And I think when students are racing to, I gotta get it done in two minutes, I missed it, what's somebody else's solution? The best thing you can do early on is be patient, let yourself struggle, and force yourself to build the connection because it's less about the pure knowledge and more about did you see that relationship that allowed you to apply the knowledge. That's great what you all are saying there. It's, it's a very different exam. And as everyone has already communicated, it's not just about what you know, but this exam is really testing your ability to reason. And so it's taking it just a, a step beyond that. So it's, it makes sense that your approach would need to be a bit varied or a bit more well-rounded. John, any other thoughts there? Yeah, I think the one thing that I would really add is take the time to study your mistakes. Um, one of the mistakes that I see people make all the time is they do a lot of practice, but they kind of look at the answer and say, oh, okay, so it was B, okay, I get that. But that doesn't really help you to figure out like, well, why did you choose something else in the first place? So taking the time to really try to figure out sort of like, well, how did I, you know, wind up with this wrong answer? Did I misread the question? You know, did I simply do something as simple as, a, as an incorrect calculation? Did I try to do the work in my head when maybe I should have written something down? That is also part of learning, you know, your own strengths and weaknesses. And as you study your mistakes, you start to realize sort of like, okay, here's how I can avoid making those mistakes in the future. Simply doing a lot of questions and looking at it and saying, oh, the answer was B, if anything is actually more likely to reinforce the mistakes that you're making, rather than giving you a way to fix them, which is ultimately what you want to do if you want that top score. Yeah, to echo David's uh, statement, know thyself. I get that. So we have some data here that'll talk about how um, right out of college, we see that the data shows that people tend to test better. The, the scores are often better when people test earlier. Perhaps they're in test taking mode or they're more connected to the information. Uh, with that being said, and you don't have to be fresh out of school to do well. That's just what the data says. You have some people, though, that get really intimidated if they've been out of school for a while. Do you have, uh, should there be a different approach for how they um, go about this whole thing? I would say yes. Um, you know, for one thing, uh, even if you did very little math in college, you probably still did some. And if it's been a long time since you've been out of school, a lot of those math fundamentals have been replaced with calculators and spreadsheets. So um, folks who have been out of school for a while would need to just do a check, make sure that those math fundamentals are in place. And if not, a lot some extra time in your prep to make sure you can get back up to speed on those basics. But also, as, as Fanay mentioned, there's sort of a test taking mentality that, whether explicitly or implicitly, we acquire uh, and matures as we're in school. But as we are out of school, that tends to decay. So you'll also want to give yourself sort of the, the permission, as, as Brian said, the permission to struggle a bit, especially here around test taking skills, sort of be charitable with yourself, but also give yourself some extra time to sort of recoup those abilities. If I can jump in with, I think we probably all, any of us that teach critical reasoning saw those statistics and were kind of like, ooh, that's a good problem because there is a little bit of correlation causation with the younger test takers. There's some reasons, hey, you're closer to the information, you're in good study mode. Some of it may be who's applying, you know, that's taking the test at 21 or 22. They're more precocious, they're more driven, you know, they're more likely as opposed to somebody wakes up at 25 and thinks, oh, I don't like my job. I want to go to school. Very few people are applying to a part-time program at 22 and only need a 600 to, uh, to get in or only need a 550 to get in. Um, so there's, there's correlation causation. If you think about that, that'll, uh, that'll help too. And then just echo a little bit of what David said. One way we like to talk about 
um, you know, the pure knowledge and skill level of knowing the, you know, the Pythagorean theorem or, you know, the difference of squares rule or something like that. It's really strength and conditioning. And so the longer you've been away for it, any of us that have played a sport um, or an instrument or anything, when we're in, you know, in tune with it, you, know, you can just pick it up and go. I was, you know, I've been in shape in my life where, you know, marathon prep was six weeks. Of, hey, I'm already running 12 miles every Saturday, just ramp it up. You know, other times it's been, hey, couch to 5K and build up from there. So just kind of recognize, consider a lot of the skill-based work. It's strength and conditioning. If you haven't been there, you just need to put in a little bit of uh, repetition before you go get clobbered by a few data sufficiency questions uh, and then, you know, don't know why you got it wrong. So um, think of it as strength and conditioning. Brian, I love that metaphor. That's exactly right. I mean, there, there is some knowledge that you need, like the Pythagorean theorem, but then it is, you know, the, the GMAT is a test of what you can do. Um, right, and can you uh, find the right answer in the right amount of time? Are you disciplined enough to keep moving throughout the test? I mean, and so it's it's both parts. You can't cram for the test because it's not just a knowledge based test, and you really do have to build up that endurance and that skill set, um, and that take practice. Yeah, and if I could jump in there for two seconds, um, one of the things that I would encourage you know somebody who's kind of returning and trying to get back into study mode is sometimes i see people that are reluctant to take a practice test early on they think you know okay i need time to you know study all of this and they keep pushing off that practice test and pushing off that practice test but that means that you're not sure what exactly you need to study so really try to view maybe the first couple of practice tests as it's not about the score that you get it's about I did, it's first and foremost about getting used to the format of the test and trying to figure out sort of like what types of things are going to give me trouble. And then beyond that, it's about trying to figure out sort of like, don't try to fix everything at once, but if you can take a practice test and identify sort of like, hey, here are two or th three things that most kept me from getting a better score this time. Well, now you've got a way to put together a study plan. Whereas if you try to do everything at once and you think I've got to learn all of this stuff before it's even worthwhile taking the test, of course it's going to seem to be overwhelming. So like test prep is also about working in stages and practice tests can really help you to figure out sort of like here are the things I most need to work on now. Right, that's great advice um, and it's, it's interesting we have um, sessions where we'll have admissions directors on and, and they're talking about uh, the overall process and they sometimes will describe preparing for the, G the GMAT as like a pre-MBA boot camp because you have to uh, really think about this strategically and formulate a plan, get a starting pay, place your, pace yourself, come back in, check in, see how you're doing. So it's kind of setting the stage uh, for that program that you'll be entering in the fall. So it's something to... Uh, to take serious, I, I like what you said about the practice exams. I meet people all the time who'll say something like, I just wanna try it out first. You know, see, see how I'm scoring, see how, see how the exam feels, where there are really other ways that uh, you might be able to go about getting that same experience, getting access to the information, and then digging in from there without spending the $250 to take that, take that exam, so. Uh, let's break the test down a little bit, though. Let's talk about um, approaches to certain sections of the exam. John, uh, do you have like a recommended approach for the essay? Well, when you're thinking about the essay, um, I think one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that um, a structured approach is best. So first off, there's a lot of material available um, for the essay, um, and much of it actually comes from GMAC. Um, there's a long list of all the prompts. It's a good thing to familiarize yourself with the prompts, not so that you can prepare every one, there's way too many of them for that, but so that you get an idea of some of the things that they ask. In the back of the official guide, there are practice, uh, or there are um, essays um, that were submitted and graded and their explanations, and that can help you to understand the um, the way in which the test, or, or the way in which the essay is scored. At the end of the day, it's kind of like there's about three things that really factor into that grading criteria. They want you to strongly support the thesis. So make sure that you pick a point and you stick with that point. They want you to be organized. So, you know, don't jump from point to point. Lay out what you're going to talk about in your introduction and then follow through in your body paragraphs and wrap it all up in your conclusion. And then 
like pay attention to um, the writing. And that's a little bit of the spelling and the grammar. You know, if your essay is hard to read because there's a lot of grammatical mistakes in it, then that can be, um, you know, that, that, that's obviously going to get a low score. But at the same time, it's okay to have a couple of spelling and grammar mistakes. Give yourself some practice, you know, write some essays, practice breaking some of the prompts down, um, but develop a template. Um, and the last thing I'd really say about the essay is I think a lot of times people try to do too much. So the essay is ultimately about looking at sort of like, here's an argument, here's its conclusion, here's the evidence for it. And you're basically writing about the assumptions that underlie that argument. And you're really trying to, um, you know, essentially say, why weren't those great assumptions? So a lot of times people will try to write, you know, sort of like about three or four assumptions, and that's really not necessary. Depth is more important. So it's better to say, I'm going to write about two assumptions, but I'm really going to treat them in a good level of detail rather than, you know, I'm going to race through three or four assumptions and your essay comes off as sort of superficial as a result. But if you practice a template, um, it's, it's, if, if you have a good template, then you should be able to achieve a good score um, with a, without, a, uh, I'll, I'll say, um, a ton of practice. <laughs> nice. Thanks, John. Jed, what about IR? Oh, integrated reasoning. Everyone's favorite. Um, integrated reasoning is great. It's, a, um, it's also probably completely different than most folks have ever seen before. Um, and, and so that means you should pay more attention to familiarizing yourself with just the format of the questions. Um, because where, whereas you probably have seen a problem solving question involving algebra or geometry before, it, it might be that you haven't seen, you know, a, a graphics interpretation question done the way the GMAT does it. Um, and so familiarity is a, is a big part of, of what you're trying to build up, but then also understanding that unlike most of the rest of the test, where um, you're the you get progressively more difficult or, or easier because you know, it grades as you go, the, the adaptive portion of the test. Um, with, with IR, you're going to see a, a range of difficulties jammed up right next to each other. And so not letting that throw you off your game as well. Um, you're certainly going to see questions that seem easy. You're certainly going to see questions that seem very hard and you can see those in direct succession. Um, so uh, making sure that, that you're taking the time to uh, build the skills that are, that are being tested, but then understanding how um, the test is asking you to respond. Because that's one of the things that I've, I've seen with a lot of my own students is they understand you know, what the answer is, but they don't understand how to tell the test that they understand the answer. Um, and so you know, making sure that you get that practice in um, really does make a difference on this section of the test. Any other thoughts there? I'd just add, I think um, the difficulty in the moment is different from the scores that people get. People come back feeling like they got, you know, just destroyed by it. They were, you know, gasping for air because it was so fast paced and they got a seven or an eight. And so almost like, you know, like a, a golfer that's in the lead on, on Sunday, will kind of look at it and say, I'm not going to try to birdie this. So I'm just going to go and, and play it careful to get the par that I need. Um, think about it that way. You don't need to get all 12 right. Um, most people have a really hard time finishing even 11 of them, and, and there's no adaptivity to it. So an easy question, if, if number 11 is easy and you don't have time for it, you're going to get it wrong. You've probably got number nine that's hard wrong. So plan to guess on one or two, particularly if, if you've taken practice tests. That, that's the one section you don't need to be perfect to get a great score, and, uh, and it's so early in the testing experience that you don't want to sell out there and then you know, be exhausted or, or just stressed for the rest of the day. Okay. Brian, why don't you um, give us an, an approach to quant? quant it, it, a lot comes back to, we were talking about with strength and conditioning. I think quant, there are a lot of things to know. We always, always start our geometry lesson by saying, the number of things you need to know to number of questions you're gonna see ratio is inordinately high. It's just there are a lot of different rules, facts, formulas, and those kind of things. But try to look at it as step one, you know, we call the skill builder at Veritas Prep is the strength and conditioning. Do you have the requisite tools? Are you comfortable with the rules you know? 
but don't lose step two, which is what do you do? So there's what do you need to know, and most people leave it there. Try to ask yourself, and, and a few people have talked about learning from your mistakes. Ask yourself, because I didn't know the content. Very often people double down on hard content when really it was just, I didn't know how to get started on that one. So I think if you um, make sure you graduate from the pure strength and conditioning to what's my game plan. You know, when I see, you know, what I was using our free seminars is with exponents, you have to know all the rules, but most people where they struggle isn't that they don't know the, the content, it's they didn't know how to start. And so you want to think in terms of verbs or action items. I want to, if I don't know what's how to start, I want to try to find common bases by factoring, you know, non-prime numbers to primes. I want to factor out to create multiplication, addition or subtraction. I want to test small numbers and those kind of things, just thinking in terms of action items rather than loose knowledge. Um, you know, to use a business analogy, there are those in business who will see, you know, oh, oil prices are up. So I'm going to look at investing in companies that do oil. Really what you know, business school is about is looking at, okay, what companies use oil? Which, you know, which companies are more dependent on shipping? It's that second or third iteration that they're testing. Very few questions above the 500 level are, do you know the fact? The most of them are, can you apply it somewhat creatively? And so give yourself action items and, and you know, don't just learn disconnected rules. To, to jump on there, I mean, consistent practice yields consistent results. That's absolutely right. Um, We'd be remiss not to mention data sufficiency, though, right? Because uh, data sufficiency is, is kind of this boogeyman. And it's it's really, um, you know, there is some knowledge you're going to need on them. But by and large, they're, they're not questions that are asking you to do a lot of work. These are questions that are directly asking you to reason with the facts that you're given, right? These are, these are executive reasoning questions. And so um, spending time understanding the format of these questions is very, very valuable because you'll, you'll quickly find that oftentimes there's no calculation that you need to do whatsoever in order to find the right answer. And so with my own students, I found that many of them come in fearing data sufficiency and actually prefer data sufficiency questions to problem solving questions by the end of the course because there's a lot less um, you know, work that you need to do on those questions if you can understand how the facts relate to one another. Great advice. David, talk us through approaching verbal. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a few pieces to this, right? There's the prep and there's the performance on the day of the test. As far as your prep goes, you gotta make sure on the verbal side, you really identify your demons early on. For example, if you're a non-native English speaker, um, you might struggle more with sentence correction. Maybe that's a little bit obvious, but it's something that's obviously worth uh, investigating, right? Um, I'd also say something else sort of in reaction to, to what Brian mentioned about the quant. You know, on, on the quant, creativity gets rewarded quite a bit. On the verbal, creativity gets punished quite a bit. Uh, so if you are adding your own assumptions, bringing in outside knowledge that wasn't present in the text, you're going to find yourself drawn towards answers that sound right to you based on your knowledge of the world, but don't fit at all with what you've read in the passage or the argument, you know, depending on what you've been given so far in the section. Um, I would also want to add one thing particular to the verbal. I mean, currently, every GMAT test taker sees the verbal section last. What happens often is folks prepare for the verbal, uh, but they do so in a way that doesn't really acknowledge the kind of fatigue that sets in on the day of the test. So when you go for the test, make sure you prepare for that part of the experience. I mean, for one, in your prep, get realistic prep, take your practice test in one sitting, learn what it feels like to have to go through three plus hours of work and then be dropped into the verbal section. Make sure you bring something, and this might sound kind of funny, but it's very important. Make sure you bring something to eat and something to drink during your breaks. You know, this, as much as we like to compare preparing for the GMAT to preparing for um, an athletic event, you know, there is a physical component to taking the test. And if your body is getting worn down as you take the test, you know, your brain is losing glucose as you make all those decisions, you've got to be refueling, recharging as you go. So there's a practical side to it as well as a, sort of the cognitive side that we like to talk a lot about. Awesome. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to contradict you at all, David. I will say that some of my non-native speakers have been the best at sentence correction um, because they had to learn the rules. And um, I don't know about everybody else's schooling, but I didn't learn all of the grammar rules in school. And I didn't learn necessarily how to analyze an argument um, and so having that formalized knowledge is really important because going with what sounds right is a recipe for disaster. 
because you know that's that's what the GMAT is testing. Do you actually know the rule? Um, so again, it's about making sure that you have the content knowledge and then are practicing it in the way that the GMAT is going to as well. So interesting. If I could just sort of respond to that, I, I don't want to get into like you know a philosophy of language debate, um, but I would say this. You know, for a lot of non uh, excuse me, a lot of native English speakers, you will find that your ear is a reliable guide for certain things. So kind of like to think of the, the ear as like a sort of a glitchy metal detector. You know, it works sometimes, doesn't work others. But if you can learn when it's reliable and sort of like silo that, like, all right, my ear is good for subject verb agreement. I can usually tell when something's off, even if it's sort of a tricky construction and they're trying to hide it from me. If your ear can pick up on those things, I would say, you know what, you can bracket that, put it off on the side and focus on dropping in the rules that are actually gonna change the way you perform on the test. And bring it all back to individualizing your prep, right? Finding what works for you, that's what it's all about. Absolutely, David. Love it, love it. Speaking of finding what works to, for you, um, we get the question all the time, how should, how should I choose a course? Should I get a course? Should I self-study? Should I do online? Uh, do you all have any insight to help candidates along in determining what course of action they should take. Brian? Good question. Um, yeah, I think a lot is, uh, so, so I work for a, a pretty good test prep company, so I should say always take a course, but I won't, hopefully my bosses aren't watching. Um, I think a lot of it is that self-analysis of, you know, don't be afraid to take a practice test early. And as a few people were taking, you know, talking about that, I've always kind of said like, I hate, practice test to see where I stand as far as a score. I think a lot of it is more, hey, how comfortable can I get with this? Is this something where, oh, I scored poorly, but I botched the timing, and now that I look at it, yeah, I'm just rusty on a couple things, and I'll get there. Or is it, oh, man, this is you know a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, and I'm going to need a little bit of help. So I think, to, you know, take some time. Take, you know, GMAC has great resources. Take one of the official practice tests to start. Maybe grab the official guide for GMAT review. Um, you know, typically when you guys, you know, it's like cars. You guys come up with a new model year. The old one goes on clearance on Amazon. It doesn't change that much. Get the old one. Um, and so just kind of see, you know, is this something I think I can do on my own? Um, and if it's not, then kind of look at what, you know, what your options are. Um, what I would say in terms of looking for, if you know you're looking for some kind of a course, Ask yourself, is it you know, a case of I need the strength and conditioning that I just, I'm rusty on the rules? And, and for me, I have a hard time. You know, it's, I, I have a conscience in, in that. I'm like, I have a hard time taking somebody's money if it's, you had that information's there. You know, I said it's, you're paying me too much to write everything I know about triangles on a whiteboard because it's in the book in nice font. My handwriting's not that great. So it's, I'm not adding a lot of value there. So ask yourself, is it a strength and conditioning issue? I just need to, to go through the reps or I don't, if, if it's more, I don't know how to start on these problems. I feel like I'm falling for trap answers. If it's that kind of case, that's where I think you get your real value back from working with a, you know, a, you know, experts with a company that can kind of help streamline that guidance at the action items and strategy level at the understanding your mistakes because we've seen people make similar mistakes. You make it once, but we've seen it a hundred times. Um, so I'd say if you kind of know you're at that point, you know, it's, you, you, you want to pay somebody, you know, if you're doing it to take you from base camp to summit, but not help you walk your way to base camp. John, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I think I would maybe add um, sort of um, a couple of things to that. Um, I, I think that the first thing that I think a lot of people need to think about is that taking a course um, is a way of building discipline into your study, okay? Um, and, you know, there could be a couple of different reasons why somebody needs discipline in their study. Um, you know, you could be that person who you could look at your past performance and you can say, you know, that time that I tried that independent study in course in college, that didn't go so well because you know what I, I i kind of need somebody telling me you know like hey do this part do this part do this part next okay um but there could also just be the issue of you could be a very busy person and you know if you have a very demanding job for example if you travel a lot for your job it can be really very beneficial for you to say okay 
as I plan out my schedule, I need to block out Wednesday night because I need to, um, you know, I, I need to go to this course. Um, I know that I've got, you know, I have to plan out an hour each day to do some homework. Um, you know, I know I need to take that Saturday and do a practice test. And so there can be a number of reasons why you might want to look at a course as it gives me that way of building some discipline into my study. Great. I just have one last thing here. Oh, David, go ahead, David. Sorry. Yeah, you know, not not all courses are created equal, and different sort of teaching philosophies are appropriate for different learners. So one thing I'd say is don't be shy about testing the waters. A lot of folks here, Manhattan Prep included, will offer you the first session free of any of our courses. Sign up, check it out, and see if it works for you. You're describing a teaching philosophy. It's sort of like describing a painting. You can do a pretty decent job, but unless you're there looking at it, unless you're there experiencing it, you're really not sure what you're getting. And uh, Kaplan, I mean, we believe in, in teachers too. I mean, uh, if, if you ask me what course you should get, you should get our Lab Online Plus course because that's the one the students say is the best. Um, it, it comes with a, a team of teachers. Um, you not just have your course session teacher and your off-camera teachers. You've got um, our, our GMAT channel teachers, you know, who are teaching three hours of live instruction available to you every night. Um, and then you also get a your plus coach will sit down with you for three hours and help you come up with a customized study plan um, and also keep you accountable, as John was saying. But then also, John, another point you made earlier was about analysis, right? Um, I'll be frank, I'm, I'm much better than, than probably most folks that are starting their prep at coming up with a customized study plan and helping you analyze your test results, because I've done it a lot more than you have. Um, I've, I've got more practice. And, and so having an expert to sit down and help you figure out, all right, here are the things that you should be working on. Here's when you should be working on. Here's how you should be working on them um, is, is tremendously helpful. Books are great, um, but it's not just the content that's different with a book where it's a two-way street. It's also all of the motivation, all of the customization that, that comes from having a live human interaction. Um, and so I, I think that that's really important. And, um, you know, you, you, the reason we offer books and videos and all the other things is so that you can find the right solution for you. But um, my default, without knowing anything else about you, is going to say, get yourself a teacher, get yourself um, some tutoring, get yourself somebody who can really help you build that customized plan. Yeah, if I if I could, um, you know, add to that for just a moment. Um, it's kind of the equivalent of most people can't read a book about golf and go out and have a great golf swing. And you know, most people, even if they've got the basics of their swing, but they want to improve it, you know, going to the driving range and, you know, constantly hitting the bucket of balls doesn't necessarily make you better. A lot of times what makes you better is paying the golf pro to stand behind you who can see everything that you're doing wrong and say, you know, hey, shift your weight differently, put your weight differently on this foot, grip the club this way. And all of a sudden things start to click into place. And that's, sort of the benefit of working with somebody who has experience with this, they can look at your score reports, they can look at, um, you know, mistakes that you're making, and often see things that it might take you a very long time to realize that you're doing. Awesome. Thank you. So with that, I know that um, a few of you talked about that you have online versus live courses. Um, John, do you, does your organization have online and live courses available in the event that candidates were interested in either? Yes, um, like, like most of the, like most of the um, test prep companies, we offer a range of products, um, everything from books up to um, tutoring. Um, and we offer um, our, our, our course in both a live online format um, and um, in an in-person format, um, we do the same thing with tutoring. You know, you can get a top tutor if you if you need to meet that tutor online. We have that available. If um, you would prefer to meet with somebody in person, we have that available. Um, so you know, again, finding that way that's going to work for you. Um, we've got you know all of the different resources that you would need to fit that study plan. Perfect. Brian, same. We do, and yeah, we do. Uh, you know, self-study programs. We've got live courses and online courses. And you know, one one thing I would urge people to do, if you're considering, I think 
if you say online course, kind of like I think Dave was talking about visualizing a piece of art and it's, you know, how do you describe it? I think when we say online course, everybody thinks of something different. The Google Hangouts here is different from WebEx, is different from other things. Um, I'd encourage people um, to test out an online course. One of the things we found, I'm sure some of the other companies thought was 2007, 2010, 2012, we we're trying to say, hey, it's the next best thing to be in there. You know, we know you can't make it to a classroom, but it's the next best thing. And we got sick of that and decided, how do we make online actually the destination? And so, um, you know, it's sort of, we always kind of find like, I think people are thinking of 10 years ago online when they say online, where, you know, we've got film studios for, you know, our top rated instructors where they can interact directly and, you know, people participate more in, in chat because, it's a little bit anonymous, it's a little bit easier, and all those kind of things. So if you're considering those families, I'd urge you, you know, and David mentioned too, just kind of check out the different, um, you know, instructors or first class free or any of those kind of things. Check out what that is and see, you know, and it's probably different, you know, company to company, at Veritas Prep, we're very proud of ours. So I uh, urge people to check that out for themselves. Great, great. And it sounds like all of you have the opportunity to uh, tibble and dabble. Um, as you know, we have our prep products and it's, as we started this off, it's all about knowing yourself, having an understanding of what you need. You do have certain people who they don't even know how to start this thing off, you know, so, so seeking out those uh, resources is great. It may also be great for you to dig into the information and, and get a basic understanding of who you are and what you actually need before you take that next step and decide. Um, if getting a course or a tutor is going to be, you know, uh, best for you. I want to get to a couple of questions and then I'm going to ask you all for your best GMAT tip and to let everybody know what uh, specials or you have, if you have any. But let's get to a couple of questions. Before, before we get there, I, I just okay. wanted to say that um, it, it's not only important for you to try out what you're, what you're getting, um, but one of the great things about our any online classroom is that it's it's geographic independent, right? Um, and we have in-person teachers every bit as good as our online teachers because our online teachers teach in person too. I just don't know happen, know if you happen to live next to one. Um, and this is really revolutionary that we can have the best teachers in front of the most students all of the time. And so you really can have an excellent experience and have not just a fantastic you know, on camera instructor, but then a team of off camera instructors answering your questions, making sure you have all the resources you need. Um, so I want to invite folks, if if you haven't seen uh, the, the new online environment that, that many of us are using, um, we've got a practice test this weekend. If you're starting your, your prep, captest.com slash GMAT, um, come take a practice test, come see what the environment is like. I think you'll be surprised. It's not, not like, you know, a, an online course you've had in the past. Awesome, and that segues into one of our questions. Uh, we are there, there's someone who's asking about what should they what should they keep in mind? What do they need to know, or how might they even approach the distinctions between books that are created by prep companies versus official GMAT materials? Um, so I'll let one of you chime in there. Yeah, I'm looking at the text of the question here. Um, it mentions exams that are from GMAT prep versus yeah. GMAC books versus test prep books. I'll just say one thing just so we're clear. Don't take a practice test from a book, right? Um, the GMAT's like a video game, right? It's adaptive. It gets harder as you do better. It gets easier as you struggle. So taking a practice test from a book is like playing a video game inside of a book. It just doesn't work, right? You're not going to get the same experience. Uh, it's going to be very different. So avoid that at all costs. As far as uh, digital resources, you know, there is, from, from our experience, uh, pretty different uses for uh, the exams written by test prep organizations versus the practice tests written by GMAC. A lot of it comes down to the capacity for analysis that's built into those. So we tend to say that GMAC uh, practice tests are best used to really get a sense for uh, the most authentic problems, since they're actual uh, former GMAT problems. Um, very realistic score, as long as you can reproduce those testing conditions uh, to the best of your ability. Um, on the other hand, practice exams, such as the ones that, that we write at Manhattan Prep, allow you to do things that you can't really do so well on GMAC practice tests, like track your individual time per problem, 
or be given um, content breakdown, so topic and, and subtopic for each of the problems that you're encountering. Um, of course, there's something very rewarding about doing that analysis for yourself, but you first got to build those tools conceptually through your prep. So we often say, you know, rely on GMAC practice tests closer towards your actual test date, so you're getting the most realistic experience and the most realistic score. But during your prep leading up to that phase, kind of like John said, think about your prep in phases, right? In those earlier phases, it can be much more helpful to have very rich analysis to give you the tools you need to make decisions during your prep. And it's not an either or proposition. I mean, that's why we have the official test day experience. You can actually go take a practice test at the Pearson View Test Center with official timing conditions and all that, and then have that rich suite of analysis afterwards. Um, so there, there are options available to you, but uh, David's absolutely right. Uh, a practice test from a book is not going to adapt to you. It's not a realistic look at what the, the test is going to be like on test day. Um, so, so bear that in mind. I'm not going to say don't, don't do it at all. I'm just going to say don't use it as a, a substitute for a computer adapted test. Great. Does anyone want to touch on the type of vocabulary knowledge that's required? I think we're all thinking no, because it's not a vocabulary test. Um, I think, you know, really the, the type of vocabulary you want to get used to is, is get your, you know, you know, we say think like the test maker a lot at Veritas Prep. Just get used to seeing authentic problems. You know, what, what do they mean when they say certain things? Some of it's more mathematical. And they say the product AB does not equal zero. It's not really vocabulary. They're just telling you none of those variables are zero. We're kind of getting a feel for, you know, wording of questions, what kind of things are they getting into, but there's no actual vocabulary required. There's just some basic like, business knowledge that you'll need. So I don't know if it quite counts as vocabulary, but just understanding what goes into gross profit. You know, you'll see terms such as those on the exam. Um, you also have to be prepared for a wide range of content in the reading comprehension. So if there are some areas in which you're just really not conversant, like I'm, I'm not a history person, this is not my thing, but don't be shocked when you see history passages on the test. So it's less about grabbing a dictionary, it's more about grabbing, you know, some sort of like Smithsonian, some sort of magazine, some publication that has GMAT level reading, so you can build those reading skills. Much more about reading than vocabulary. Yep. So any advice for people who plan to um, self-study? There are a lot of people who take it on on their own and, and they do pretty well. Um, some people do very well by approaching it on their own. Do you have any advice for those who just choose to go at it on their own and in terms of approaching the exam? You should study as little as possible to hit your target score but you need to study as much as you need to in order to hit your target score. Um, just like on test day, right? I want you to do as little work as you need to in order to get the right answer, but you gotta do enough work to get the right answer. Um, and you know, we use as a guideline 100 hours of prep because you know, our top scores tend to average that, but it's an average. Um, and, and so each and every student is different. Some students will need to do more work than that to hit their target score. Some students will need to do less. And so that's why starting with a practice test and seeing where you're starting, seeing what your strengths and weaknesses are um, is so useful in creating that study plan because without knowing where you're starting, you know, we can't really map out how you're going to get to, to your success. I think I would go back to, you know, sort of there are, there are essentially two wrong paths that you could go down um, for study, for self-study. The first is to think that all I need to do is read a book. Certainly content knowledge is important. And if you know that you're weak on certain content areas, yes, absolutely, you're going to have to grab a book and you're going to have to review those concepts. But you also have to do practice problems. The way you get better is applying that knowledge to problems and getting used to the way that GMAC phrases questions, getting used to the difficulty levels of the questions, getting used to, you know, figuring out like, can I do this in the right amount of time? How do I, you know, shave 30 seconds off of this problem? The other wrong path that you could go down is just doing problem after problem after problem and never taking the time to analyze, you know, sort of like, well, why am I making mistakes? Um, you know, what can I do to get better? And so your, your prep always has to be a blend of those two things. You know, if you spend some time studying some content, then balance that out with doing some practice problems. If you're doing the practice problems, make sure that you build into that the idea of I need to go and review these problems. 
Um, I need to think about sort of like, you know, even if you got the right answer, was it the best way to get the right answer? Was there maybe a more efficient way to get the right answer? What, you know, think about different ways that you can solve problems. Because sometimes when a really hard problem is staring you in the face at the test, sometimes you have to be able to sort of like pull on a big toolbox. And, you know, if you've only ever sort of like looked at a problem one way, you may have to wind up sort of like just picking an answer on that problem and moving on. Whereas if you've practiced different ways to look at problems, you now have different ways that you can approach it. So if the first approach wasn't working, you can back up for a moment and say, what else can I try? So if you're studying on your own, you have to kind of like have that blend of content knowledge, certainly, but make sure you build in a healthy amount of time to do practice. Great. Uh, I feel like you're echo echoing our uh, test makers. We've had psychometricians on for these types of events, and um, they always say the most important thing is, go is going to be simulating those test center conditions. And I, I, you all have spoken to that several times, and that's in environment, that's in practicing the questions, that's in doing computer adaptive practice. Uh, that's also having um, a strategy. You you mentioned thinking about it, understanding why, why you're answering a certain way and have, having a thought behind, when am I gonna guess? How am I gonna build that into how I approach this exam? So I think all of those are great nuggets there. Were you gonna jump in and say anything additional there, David? Um, nothing too revolutionary, just uh, John said a lot of really great stuff. I mean, generally you'll find there's more value in doing the same problem twice than doing two different problems. And people often try to go broad instead of going deep and that can be a big mistake. As far as keeping track of the analysis you do on, on your work, I think an error log can be really helpful, sort of a really practical piece of advice that I give to all of my students. Build some kind of document, you know, a spreadsheet works really well. Uh, of course, you can just do it by hand if you prefer to do that. And make sure the error log includes areas for, you know, not just the sort of basic information on the problems, so you can look them up, but that real analysis that John was talking about, right? So where did I go wrong here? What could I have done differently? And it doesn't even have to be an error log. It can be just a strategy log. You can have problems that you got right there, but realize you could have done in a different way and inco incorporate that into that document. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say since we're talking about self-prep is that there are lots of ways to prep on your own, right? It could be grabbing books uh, and purchasing some practice tests and using that just to kind of hack it together on your own. Uh, it could be something like, you know, we have this product GMAT Interact, which is in, in in many ways, you know, comprehensive, it goes through all the material in the course. It doesn't put you into a classroom, but it does give you an interactive experience that allows you to work through the content and in a way that responds to your performance as you go. So, you know, giving yourself room to be creative about how you prep on your own and looking at the different options out there might sort of expand the, the model that you have in your mind for what that could look like. Thank you. We have a person asking, so in an instance, where you're trying to increase your score. You already got a good score. 710, trying to go to 760. The question is, based on what uh, you all have shared today, are you suggesting that this person take a course to get to that? Is is that their only option? Or is there, you know, what what should they do in that situation? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be greedy and jump in on this one. Um, not all 710s are created equal. Right. So if you find that your your gaps are sort of wide ranging, like a little bit in fractions, decimals and percents, a little bit here in word problems, some over there with sentence corrections some glitches with critical reasoning, then you're going to have to work through all of those different topics. And a lot of that is going to be discovery. Like, well, OK, well, I know critical reasoning gives me trouble, but like where in here am I having specific difficulties for those circumstances? A class might be exactly the right move. On the other hand, if you realize that the gaps between your, your 710 and that 760 that you're shooting for are really confined to a handful of areas like, man, I'm really bad at geometry, right? Something like that. Then you're sitting through a whole class of which perhaps only one or two sessions are really going to focus on that area. It's a, not a very good use of your time or your money. In those circumstances, either some self prep, you know, grabbing the resources that are specific to those areas, maybe bringing a tutor in to help you out for a sort of constrained amount of work might be a better path, but do some digging, right? The same way that a lot of folks here have been saying, uh, a practice test isn't just there to give you a score. I mean, look at that practice test, look underneath the score, figure out the, the spectrum of difficulties you're having and let that guide your choice. I agree entirely and I wanna generalize the point. 
there's no two test takers that are the same, just as there's no two 710s that are the same. Um, and uh, I think everybody here will agree that, you know, there are thousands of available practice questions to you. You don't need to do all of those. You need to do the right combination of those to build up the skills that you need to hit your target score. Um, this is why we have the GMAT channel. It's three hours of live instruction every night. I don't expect every student to go to all three hours every night. That's crazy. What I expect them to do is find the sessions that are right for them. Um, and so that they can target those skills. And it's, it's really that analysis piece that John was talking about and then finding the right resources to fill in those gaps. And just one more, so, you know, not all 710s are created equal. Not all courses are created equal. And so I think another one is, is test out and kind of see, you know, we've got, um, you know, why is GMAT Club's number one rated instructor in the world is, uh, is my friend Ravi that teaches for us. And his, his mantra is 99 percentile or bust. If you're trying to get to 760, you, don't, you want somebody who's not going to sugarcoat, who from minute one is, hey, we're off to the races. I expected that you did the homework, and you know, based on that, we're going to build off of it. That might be a perfect fit for you, whereas other classes where you know, I think we've all, as, as high achievers, been in classes, realize, oh, no, this is just a review session from last week. We're not getting much out of it. So I would say you know, analyze, and that's kind of been a huge theme for all of us, you know, what, you know, do you know what you need to work on? If you do, then maybe attack that. If not, a course or a tutor may be a good fit. And then do your homework on that to see, you know, which, which one seems like it'll be the best fit for you. Great. Now we have another question here. I think we've addressed it, but if anybody could just quickly speak to um, any thoughts about how many times you should redo a problem and when you redo it, the things you should be paying attention to if your goal is to um, not make the same mistakes again and again. So any thoughts there? So the biggest thing there is, um, you know, making sure you're not just reviewing somebody else's steps. Um, we even talked a little bit about, you know, study strategy and all. So if you're re just redoing what your tutor told you to do or what the back of the book told you to do, that's time wasted. Um, you know, one of the strategies I tell people is if you're struggling with a problem, don't look for the, somebody else's explanation. Just figure out what answer choice it is and then try to connect the dots and meet in the middle. And so if you're redoing problems that it's been long enough since you've seen them um, or, you know, you got it wrong once and you haven't looked at it, but now that you've looked at the right answer, you want to try again. Um, make sure you're forcing yourself to build connections instead of just repeating what somebody else told you. Um, and, you know, I think that would be the key. And, and make sure you're doing something differently, right? Um, doing the same problem the same way is, is not going to, to lead to any great insights. Um, so if you have a reason to, to try a new strategy or to uh, approach it in a, in a different way, that's great um, and encouraged. But um, just rehashing what you've already done uh, probably isn't going to be super useful or enlightening. Awesome. I'll just add one more thing, you know, um, building on what, uh, what Brian was saying. Using explanations uh, should be something that you do judiciously. And, you know, if, let's say you do a problem and you really have no idea where to start. It's tempting to dive into the explanation and just try to consume that, that information. Um, one thing I recommend to students a lot, though, is something we call try, hint, try, which means you try to get the problem started. And if you really don't have anywhere to go, grab the explanation, but just read the first line, read the first sentence, and see if sort of giving yourself little drips of the explanation as you go can't sort of stimulate your own thinking around the problem. And as soon as you feel some confidence with where you need to head, explanation goes away and you're off to the races finishing the problem. So, you know, get creative with how you use the resources you have. You don't have to admit sort of total defeat by turning to the explanation. You can incorporate it in more creative ways into your prep. Awesome. Thanks. We've shared, you guys have given so many great nuggets, like, awesome nuggets I'd be excited if I was watching um if you said it already what would be the one thing you would leave the viewers with your best tip or piece of insight as it relates to the exam Brian go um, well, at uh, Veritas Prep, we use the phrase, think like the test maker. I love you throwing out test maker and psychometrician together. Um, I think in order to be a well-rounded uh, test taker, you really want to study in three phases. What do you need to know? We talked about that as strength and conditioning. What do you need to do, which is what is your strategy, it's your action items on certain problems? How do I get started? 
And then we call think like the test makers, what do you need to look out for? It's kind of scouting the opposition. And so, you know, my favorite kind of my new toy right now that most people have just never thought of is really for all of math. But particularly, you know, Jeff was talking about data sufficiency being kind of its, its own thing. If they ever ask for a combination of variables, it's a weird question. If it's what is X, you play a trade. But if it's what is 6X minus Y or what is the sum of the perimeters of the two rectangles or something like that, they asked you for a weird question. There's a reason they did that. And usually it's because it's easier to solve for the combination than for the individual variables. And so that's one example. If you kind of look at, hey, what clues are they leaving for me? You know, when they write questions in a strange way, um, you can really pick up on kind of understanding, you know, uh, David mentioned a lot, know thyself. Well, it's also kind of, you know, part and parcel with know thy enemy. And, you know, one thing of you guys as enemies, you're nice people, but it's who's writing the question, you know, where do they tend to, to leave traps? But maybe even more importantly, where do they tend to use clues? Like, oh, they said, if they say non-negative, that means zeros in there. If they say positive, that means zeros not. Why type non-negative and try to figure out, do I hyphenate it, do I double the end? You know, it's, they spent, they, they, you know, carefully deliberated over using that word. And so, um, you know, we say think like the test maker. That's what it is. It's when you're learning, what kind of things didn't you see the first time you need to train yourself to look out for in the future? Love it. Strike the enemy statement from the record, though. But think like the test. You leave clues for us, too. There's breadcrumbs on the trail. Love it. John? Yeah, I would, I would say um, basically learn what the GMAT tests. So one of the things that tends to happen to people when you look at a hard math problem is, you know, when you have that feeling of, oh, no, I don't know how to get this started. Uh, what's going on here? I think your brain kind of somewhat naturally goes to all the weirdest, hardest math that you've ever learned in your life, and you start trying to go down that path. And it is very, very unlikely that the GMAT problem is actually about that. It's actually much more likely that they're testing a relatively common concept that they test all the time, just in a creative and unusual way. Lots of the very hardest problems on the GMAT have a certain sort of like, you know, elegance to them. Um, it, it, somebody has found a really interesting way to ask about an average, for example. But if you start going down that path of, you know, hey, this could be about some crazy concept that I heard about once, you're probably not going to solve the problem. If you back up for it for a moment, though, and say, what kind of clues are, it, are in here that could help me to try to identify the concept that's actually being tested in probably a weird way, then now you've got a much better way to like approach that question. Great. We only have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any... Um offers or specials or promotions or anything like that going on that our audience should know about? Uh, I, before we get there, I want to say that the test maker is not your enemy. The test maker is your friend. The test right. maker gives you a tremendous opportunity. Find out what, what the test wants from you and give it to them and you'll be rewarded with a great score. And no, this is really important because your GPA probably isn't going to change much, but you totally can change your GMAT score. Uh, all of us have seen students do this all the time. Um, you are worth investing in, you can do this. You just have to take it seriously and put the time in. That's the part that we can't do for you, right? We can't give you the effort. We can't do the work for you. Um, we can point the way though. And so really take this seriously and you can absolutely make, it, make a tremendous difference in your life, in your career. Um, so you're worth investing in, you deserve this, but you have to do the work. You have to make it happen. Couldn't have said it better. Uh, promos, uh, yeah. send 200, we'll give you $200 off any of our courses. Uh, there you go. <laughs> awesome. Brass tax. <laughs> Dropping jewels. Yep. Manhattan prep is offering, um, with, uh, with enrollment in any of our courses or, uh, full on demand products. Uh, additionally enrollment in any of our advanced workshops, we have advanced data sufficiency, sentence correction, advanced quant workshops. So, those are great uh, sort of add-ons to get included with your course, as well as a free 30-minute one-on-one session with an instructor. So a little bit of tutoring to kind of jumpstart your, your prep or kind of help you clean up at the end if you'd rather use it towards the end of your class. 
I'd say uh, check out veritasprep.com and see, you know, what's, uh, what we have that suits your needs. And we talk, you know, where does the test maker leave clues? We know we tend to attract savvy students. So uh, where, where does the marketer leave clues? If you ever want to know what discounts are available, just Google Veritas Prep discounts and you'll, you'll find what's, uh, what's available there. Okay. And at Princeton Review, we're currently offering $200 off of our um, ultimate live online and in-person courses. Great. Thank you, fellas. We have one last question. Uh, how many times do you suggest to take the test? It will hurt me to take it more than once. Is that true? Yeah, saw but that I one. Think, no? Nope. Uh, what do you feel? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's sort of a myth, right? I mean, for one, yeah. these days, if you if you get a score that falls below a previous test score, you can just cancel it, and GMAC will not include that score on your score report. So there's a little bit of security there. You're not going to have, like, you know, bunch of scores sort of stacked up. I've also, and this is anecdotal, but I've heard quickly, I've heard stories from students in which taking the test only once actually hurt them. So students who apply with a score that's below what the school is typically looking for, if they see you've only taken the test once, that raises some questions. Like, where's your grit? Like, why didn't you go in to try to take the test one more time? And I've actually worked with students who got negative feedback from schools because they took the test only once and submitted a score that was below what they were looking for. So be thoughtful about it. And remember, you know, schools really are mostly interested just in your highest score. But don't take it just to see. There's no reason to go in unprepared, right? Like you, you only need to take it once. So we would rather just take it once because it's not it's not a, a, a laugh riot, right? It's like <laughs> be prepared for it, take it seriously, do it once, do it right. If something terrible happens, no worries, right? You can cancel that score, you can take it a different time. That's great. Um, but, but really, let, let's aim to just take it that one time. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We have a comment said, excellent, insightful advice has been shared by all the hosts, and I would tend to agree. It's been great having you all on. Again, thank you all so much. I know we went one minute over, but the information is just so great. We had to keep it going. So thanks so much. Thank you for joining us today. Remember, go and complete our candidate survey, mba.com backslash surveys, and we wish you the best of luck. Thanks and take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.